high. Um, Sunday night, uh, nine o'clock. And today, well, tonight, I am going to chat to you about mutations, mutants, coronaviruses, the ideas behind mutagenesis, because actually it's really interesting. And of course, we're doing that with a glass of wine. Um, Jean, Jen, nice to see you. Nice. To, have you got your wine? I really hope you got your wine. I'm going to have a sip now. Is that rude to have a sip while I'm giving a video? I don't think so. I think it's actually a very good idea. So I'm going to have that sip of wine now. Very nice. Right. So tonight, as I said, I, I want to talk to you about mutations, mutagenesis. It's something I've been interested in for a very long time. In fact, I would say it to me is the, is, is the um, most interesting thing about um, evolution. It's the, it's the stuff of evolution. It's the stuff of, um, it's the only reason we have any variation in our world around us, you know, in terms of living things. A, life is completely dependent upon this process of and uh, the process is called mutagenesis, all right? So the process of making mutations is called mutagenesis. Things have to change. If there were no mutants, if we didn't undergo any kind of variation, we'd all be the same, Remember, pretty dull. Uh, viruses are quite famous for, especially viruses like the coronavirus and HIV and influenza and the cold, typical cold viruses polio viruses, those are all what we call RNA viruses. So they have, they, they tend to mutate faster than most other things, right? Now, why is that? Um, quite simply, they have very small, uh, they, gen they don't have a lot of genetic material. We've got a ton of genetic material. So we actually can't afford too much in the way of mutations because uh, there's too many of us, uh, too many cells. So a high mutation rate, a high rate, is going to cause too much damage. Generally speaking, I actually uh, wanted to give you an example of what I mean, like some kind of simple model that you can get your head around what the idea of mutagenesis is. So, bear with me while I turn around. Um, I have built a what I call a wobbly machine to illustrate the idea of what mutagenesis is, all right? So what I'm gonna do is switch it on, okay? And just listen while I try and explain what, how this is actually a metaphor, all right? This thing that you're looking at here is a metaphor for the whole process of evolution, okay? All right, it's a metaphor, it's not actually evolution. So what I mean by a metaphor? So if you come down here, you'll see, this is like us, all right? Um, pretty stable, sturdy thing. There's change, there's repetition, and it's slightly wobbly, so that's a metaphor for, there's an accommodation for a little bit of mutation, all right? Can't afford too much. Gets too much, this whole thing loses its structure, loses its form. But as things get smaller and simpler, as living systems get simpler, can move up the chain, and I've got this bird here, right? He's my wobbly bird. Now he is a metaphor, again, for a virus. See how, the system is more wobbly, it's very wiry, it's almost not even there. So that represents a state where there's a lot of change accommodated. And that chicken, it's actually a chicken, is sitting on what is called the threshold, all right? Any more change in this wire chicken, it no longer resembles a chicken, okay? It no longer resembles the bird that it is. So that is the metaphor for the evolutionary process. The more complex, more, more cells, more uh, large the organism like us, the less wobble, the less wobbliness it can accommodate, i.e. the less mutations it can accommodate. The simpler it gets, the more change it can, and it can accommodate. So this is a metaphor for how I see evolution. So we're going to switch off our wobbly machine. Now... So, so basically the bottom line is most mutation is actually of little consequence, to be honest. Most mutation is what they call silent mutation. It doesn't actually affect the function of the gene. But 
there is enough that does cause a uh, change in the um, in the uh, genetic information. And that's the things we have to be concerned with. And there's been information that's come out now. Okay, so there's been a paper that came out quite recently. Um, it's this paper over here. Well, first of all, let's take a quick look at why it's of any value. The bottom line is, uh, we know that viruses make us sick, all right? Well, this we're talking about the coronavirus now, okay? Why does it make us sick? And why do some people not get sick? And why is there variation in the amount of sickness? Now, so we're just taking a little bit of a sidestep, a little bit of a step to the left, okay? There are three things I think we have to think about. Well, really, yeah, really three things, okay? The first reason is there's our genetics, okay? Our specific genetic makeup. We are all variants of the same essential idea, the same essential genotype, okay? Uh, there's variation between us. We're not all exactly the same. So a virus or anything will have a different effect on each, on, on all of us, all right? I don't believe that's a huge thing here because as we know, um, the coronavirus, you know, it can affect, can infect bats, it can infect quite a few different species. So our genotype is probably not that important, all right? What is probably more important is the other component which affects um, how sick we might get, and that is the environment, okay? Now, the environment I've broken up into two bits here. There's the environment inside us, all right? So in other words, how healthy we are, how well we eat, um, whether we have any other what they call comorbidities. Those things are all going to affect how sick the virus makes us. There's also the Grady environment, all right? Um, how how general well-being is in life, you know, if we have access to good medical facilities, if we live in over overcrowded conditions, all those things might have a bearing. I just love how this, there's a reflection here, uh, which looks a lot like a coronavirus, okay, which is, I didn't put that there, it's not part of the presentation, but look how, how lovely is that sort of came in. Now, so that's the other environmental component. We actually see evidence of, in the United States, where... Uh, African Americans tend to be more affected. There's, I think, a higher rate of mortality in those communities, and that probably has a lot to do with their external environment, uh, having less access, possibly, to to uh, healthcare and and, and um, things like that. Of course, the question that's being asked in this study, and the study that I'm talking about, we'll get to in a second. But the real question is, what about the variation of the genotype of the virus? Okay. What about virus mutants? Okay, remember my, my really cool chicken over here? This is our metaphor for our virulent, virulent virus in the form of a chicken. Now, what kind of variation can we get in, in, um, in the virus that can lead to different pathogenesis? Okay, different degrees of sickness. So that is actually the question that this study that was published quite, and it wasn't published, all right? This is another one of these papers that are in a preprint uh, pre um, form, okay? Uh, this one was uh, from a Chinese group. In fact, quite a prominent Chinese group. I think they were the first, um, they were part of the lab which suggested they have the lockdowns in the first place. It's a very prominent lab. Um, I think I've done, a, and I've looked into, the, uh, into who they are, and they've done quite a bit of work on different pandemics, the flu, uh, flu influenza pandemic. So they, they, you know, they are obviously, um, uh, you know, not to be snuffed, not to be sniffed at, if that's even an expression. So what they decided to do, and they wanted to answer that question, right? What if, if they've, um, are there mutant viruses out there, mutant coronaviruses out there that are causing differences in the pathogenesis, Okay. Is it possible that we can attribute some of the different disease outcomes to the pathogenesis of the virus? In other words, to the different genetics of the virus. Now, there's a fair amount of evidence. This is a, don't worry too much about this figure, but this was published in a very prominent journal. This was actually, that was actually published. This is a different study now. Uh, in the uh, journal called The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So a very prominent journal. And they published... Basically, they isolated a whole lot of viruses, coronaviruses, from this current um, current outbreak and essentially sequenced the genomes and found that there's a fair amount of variation. 
which is exactly what you'd expect, okay? So in other words, this over here suggests there's a lot of different coronaviruses out there. SARS-CoV-2 seems to come in many different forms. Now, before we sort of get too excited about that and think, oh, what does that mean? Is that, a, is that, is that gonna be a problem? The bottom line is most of those variants are gonna be um, uh, not gonna confirm much in the way of um, an adaptive advantage because most, as I said earlier, most mutations are actually silent, right? They don't have an effect. So there's only a really small subset that have an effect. So what you're looking at here is more than likely uh, just variation. And it's very useful variation because it means that we can actually map exactly the trajectory of this virus by looking at all the subtly different uh, sequences. So it's actually really useful that they do have quite a high mutation rate. But what is the consequence of these mutations? So let's go back to this original study and let's look at how they did it and let's see if they found something. Right, so I had a look to see how they did the study, and, and very simply, um, what they did is in the very early stages of the outbreak, uh, where's my pointer, where's my pointer, between the 22nd of January and the 4th of February, they isolated virus from 11 patients, okay? This is just a very oversimplified image of what this epidemic curve looks like, okay? global numbers of infected people over there, and that's the time in days. And you can see their sampling was done at the very early stage of the pandemic, all right? All in Wuhan, all at the very epicenter of the outbreak. Okay, so that gives us a little bit of a sense of um, where they got their samples from. In other words, their samples were actually very close together. Um, you know, they were not from a broad spectrum of the entire global pandemic. They were just from a very narrow subset of the actual, um, of the actual initial uh, outbreak, all right? So that gives you some kind of clue already that we're looking at a very early stage. We're not necessarily going to see the whole global story. Or oh, let's have a look to see what actually happens. So that's, um, I, I thought I'd just mention that some interesting things about the study. Um, Right. The other thing is, you must also understand that this is all happening in the heat of the moment. There's this in outbreak uh, exploding on the scene. And, you know, they probably like in a hurry to get some understanding of what was going on. So they just really, there was no clear criteria in who they selected virus from. They didn't really, they, it turns out they got from a reasonably good range of patients. Some that were very sick, some that were not that sick, some that were mildly asymptomatic. I'm, I think they probably were reasonably cognizant of trying to do that. Uh, as I said, yeah, all except for one of the patients had moderate or worse symptoms, all right? So uh, that's what they said, uh, moderate or worse, either moderate or guy was not doing so well. Three of the patients had comorbidities and one patient needed ICU. Only 11, they only sampled from 11 people, all right? And the good news is, as it turns out, that all 11 did survive and went home afterwards. So, l'chaim to them. Right, so where does that leave us? Now, the other thing I wanted to look at was how they did the study, all right? Because actually that's quite critical. Okay, so if you're going to look, so what they did was, very simply, what they wanted to do was harvest these 12, these viruses from 12 patients and then look to see how these, first of all, ask the question, has this virus changed? Are they identical or identical to each other from this stage of the outbreak? Or is there variation? Have there been mutants? Like how mutated are these viruses? So the second thing they wanted to do is if they found variation, they wanted to take those viruses and in, do what's called in vitro studies, okay? And that means they wanted to study the behavior of the virus, how it infected cells, not inside a person, not inside an animal, but inside a cell that was grown in the laboratory. So the idea being that they take the virus out of the body, which is very easy to do. You get a syringe, you take some serum, you separate the blood pod, you're left with the serum, and then you basically, and this is actually quite interesting, and I think a flaw, possible flaw of the study, is they take the virus and they put it in what's called, um, so they literally take the blood out, they separate the viral fraction, which is straightforward, and then they infect those uh, viruses into what are called Vero E6 cells. Now, what are Vero E6 cells? 
Those are actually cell, a cell line that we use in the laboratory and that I've had a lot of experience with. Most people who've worked with viruses and back, probably more viruses have worked with the various cell line because a lot of viruses just like it in there. They like that cell line. So the problem, of course, is, is that this Vera cell line is actually a monkey cell line. It's from the African green monkey. So it's not, um, it's actually, you know, maybe not the best cell line to use. Um, and then what they did was they basically allowed those viruses to infect the cells, and then they gave it four to five days for the virus, because there's not a lot of viruses you actually get out of blood, believe it or not. I mean, the way we're talking about the viruses, uh, in, you think it was thick, like a molasses, but really there's actually not a lot of virus per, per volume of blood, all right? So you've got to amplify it. You've got to make a lot as much as you can. And you amplify it in the Vero cells, okay? Now, this is where I have a, a, quite a big problem with the study. And, and and not that I necessarily, um, to do it properly, I mean, to really do this, you need a lot more time, okay? So I don't think it had time yet. And you actually need to directly analyze the viral mutants that are inside the body, all right? So, but that's quite intrusive. And when someone's recovering from a disease, obviously not an ideal situation. So it's a very hard study to get right. So this is the next best thing. They put it in a cell line, but we must keep in mind that this is an animal cell line, okay? A monkey cell line. And also, it's very cushy inside a cell. It's a lovely life. I mean, there's no immune system hammering away at the cells. It's, uh, it's quite a nice life for four or five days. But, so what they're doing is they're growing this virus, they're getting up its numbers so they can do proper studies with it in these green animal, African green monkey cells, okay? Which is fair enough. But during that time that you're growing it up in those cells, it's because it's an RNA virus, because it has a reasonably high mutation rate, it is already going to start changing, okay? Probably not a lot and maybe not, maybe insignificantly, but it is an important caveat and an, I think a relevant criticism of the study. But they wanted to do these in vitro studies, um, and they wanted to see if they were pathological. Uh, and and to, again, to do it properly, you should take a whole lot more isolates. Um, uh, but they started with 11, and they were lucky in a sense because they found some variation. But I'm jumping the gun a bit. They grow up these viruses nice and thick, get lots of it, and then they can sequence the uh, genome. They can read the exact genetic structure of the virus. They can see how different they are from each other. And then the important thing that they wanted to do is they wanted to take those viruses and quite simply infect them back into Vera, these green monkey cells, and see how damaged the cells get. And can they get a correlation between the mutations that were arising in the virus and how sick the cells got? So it's, you know, on paper, it sounds pretty good, and it's not bad, uh, but I do think, it, uh, I, I think it's a bit of a rush job, to be honest, uh, and who can blame them? It's a, it's a situation that requires a, a lot of rushing about. But anyway, let's see what they found. So, look, um, this is quite a complicated figure, and I definitely don't want to get into it. Uh, so, for that, I'll just show you my face again, just to avoid that figure. Um, but the bottom line is they, they found... Uh, quite a few variants, and, and nine, they found 31 mutants, 31 unique mutations, all right? Uh, and 19 of those were actually completely novel. Now, I don't want to go on about all the different ones because it's not the purpose of what I'm trying to get across here. I'm trying to get across um, how some mutations that do, can, change the um, information of the proteins that they encode because that's the only way a mutation can actually have an effect. It has to change the information of the protein that it codes for. And then you can check, does that change protein change the behavior of the virus? Okay, so that's really what you're looking at. So um, that takes me to, uh, I'm going to just mention a couple of very simple, uh, very, uh, uh, just briefly mention a couple of the mutants, because there actually were some intriguing results in that department. Um, the, the most, f for me as a, as a geneticist or as a formerly practicing geneticist, I, the most striking thing is, and again, let me just show you my face because there's no point reading that. Um, um, they, 
in two completely different viruses that they isolated from two completely different people, they got the same mutation, all right? Uh, in, in, slightly different, um, in a slightly different formulation, so that it told them that the same mutation happened twice independently. When you see that, all right, so when you see the same thing happening twice and you're convinced that it's definitely the same thing happening twice and not just that you got the same thing, but you've picked it up twice, all right? It actually happens separately, all right? That suggests that there is actually a um, change in the virus that gives the virus some kind of advantage because the chance of getting the same mutation twice is actually very, very low. Lo and behold, um, the, the, key, the key finding from this is that that mutation was hap happened in the S protein. Now, you might remember the S protein. Uh, that's the protein that protrudes from the surface of the virus, and that's actually the pro such a significant protein because that interacts with the immune system. So the immune system recognizes that protein because it sticks out, and then that's why it recognizes antibodies specifically bind to those S proteins because they stick out. But they're very important proteins. So what that protein does that protrudes out of the virus surface, out of the virus capsid, is it helps the virus attach to the receptor on the cell, okay? Now the receptor on that cell is called ACE2 receptor and it's actually at that exact protein where, there is, where the binding happens. And not just the exact protein, at the exact little tiny part of the protein that touches the receptor is very, very, very extremely, highly, significantly close to where that mutation happened. Strongly suggesting that there was selection for uh, this mutation. In other words, this is now the first evidence or amongst the first evidences of virus mutations happening in the community, which are giving some kind of advantage to the virus spreading. Okay. There was one other one, and I'll just focus a little bit on that one. Um, uh, there was another mutation. Let me not even go into the details. A very, um, quite a low probability mutation that also happened. And what I want to show you about that is quickly just show you how they do these cytopathic studies. And, and that's very, very simple. They infect the virus into cells, okay? So they take the virus, there's me again, take the virus, mix it with the cells, and then they monitor the cells after two hours, after four hours, after six hours, one day, two days. They count how much virus is there to make sure the virus is actually growing, and they show that it is. And then they check to see, is the virus having a cytopathic effect on the cells, okay? It's a very straightforward question, right? Is the virus growing? Yes. And is it damaging the cells? I mean, the virus is growing, but it's not damaging the cells. It suggests maybe there's not a pathological consequence. So what is really interesting about the second mutation they found is that um, it was, and it's not very easy to read from the graph, but just to kind of, um, this is showing an increase in virus. And this is the mutation I was talking about, this one that's quite rare. But this suggests that it had a quite a significant damage on the produced quite a lot of virus, and in another figure which I'm not going to show you, correlated with it also damaging those cells more than others. So they suggest in the paper that that's a very significant thing to look at, and that there's something really interesting about that mutation. What is also interesting, and this is the only thing I actually think had um, was mm, that turns out that the patient who had that mutation. They were in hospital for the longest, and they took the longest to clear the virus. Now, that's interesting, yes, but they're just simply not enough isolates to draw any conclusion from. A, that's the, the biggest problem. The second biggest problem is that um, these are in vitro studies. At best, they probably, if they could have, and again, it's all logistics and things they are still figuring out, they maybe should have used an animal model, like a ferret, which does show, does show some disease from this coronavirus infection. I don't know if they even knew that at the time of the study. So this was probably the next best thing. It was a bit of a rush job, but it does infer and allude to the possibility that there are uh, mutate, mutants out there that are having an effect on the, uh, vi the pathogenesis. Now, there's a, quite a bit of hype out there that you know, New York is a more deadly version of the coronavirus, and so does Italy than the rest of the world. Now, 
I am convinced you can't say that. I don't think there's enough data to even begin to say something along those lines. It's too early. It makes for a good headline. And that, I think, is the bottom line. Um, yeah. So there was something else I wanted to say. Um, hmm. Of course, I can't remember now. Yeah, of course. Um, so what was it? It's going to drive me nuts. Maybe if I have another sip of wine, it'll come back to me. Um, ah, yeah, it was just this. Um, the one good thing about the lockdowns um, or the, the uh, self-isolations and the general slowdown in our lives is that it limits um, the spread of the virus, obviously. But what that also does is there's no selection for the virus to be a fast spreader, okay? It doesn't serve any purpose for it to become a better, a better, more pathological virus, because there's nowhere for it to go. There's actually a bit of selection for it to become a more moderate virus. The faster it spreads, the more virulent it can become because there's nice selection for it to become more virulent. So the one good, another good thing about the um, our general isolation is it's going to make it less likely for the emergence of more virulent strains of the virus. That's the only thing I can think that, well, one reason why I think these, um, these, these it's not a bad idea Besides the fact that you're not overwhelming the health system and, you know, there's fear of people getting sick. I mean, I don't know what the long-term consequences of that are going to be. That's a whole other story. But uh, the bot but uh, limiting their spread does reduce the selection for more virulent viruses. So that is what I wanted to say. Now, there's a couple of questions. Let me just have a quick look. Um, I'll see if I can address one or two of those. Um uh, so let's just have a look here. I waved, apparently. Um, still figuring out the technology. As you can see, the virology studio is not the most high-tech uh, studio in the world. Thank heavens for that. Um, right. Um, so, now, uh, let's have a look. Question, Martin. Uh, is there a common time for viruses like these to move from one successful mutation for another, for example? Sorry, Martin, I can't actually read the rest of the question. It, let me see if I can pick it up on my lap them on my um, desktop because it doesn't allow me to read the whole question on my phone here. So I'm going to have a quick look uh, if I can even find it on here. Uh, hang on a sec. I'm, I might not be able to answer that question um, because I'm turns out I'm just really slow. Um, yeah, I can't see the comments, uh, which is frustrating. Um, so, I don't know, Martin, can you ask, ask that same question, but in a, just in a short form, <laughs> if you don't mind? Um, these to move from one successful mutation to another. Is there a common time? Uh, if I, okay, so I think what you're asking, uh, you mean, how often does it happen? Or if that is the question, um, no, um, it can happen anytime. But obviously, the more virus out there, the more circulating virus, the more opportunities for mutations. It's all about numbers. If there's a l very few viruses circulating in the world, there'll be much more limited opportunity to get those changes that are required. Um, because the changes are all low probability, even though they're a high mutation, right, they're all quite low probability events. So, um, so yeah, and I see your question, like, example, every two days in New strain. Yeah. Uh, it's look. I don't know. Is 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 the truth to that? It it you can get, uh, and I think my previous answer sort of addresses that. Um, when there's a new strain, uh, even if there's a new strain, most of the time, and a strain is a strong word for it. This is a variant. I would call it a variant more than a strain. Subtle variations, which probably confer no uh, no genetic advantage. So I wouldn't worry too much about that for now. Uh, Jonathan Shapiro asks any further findings about BCG. Great question, Jonathan. I don't know, unfortunately. I, I need to read up more on that. Um, someone mentioned to me that they didn't really find any great connection there, So, but I don't know for sure. It's maybe something I can look into for the future. So thanks for asking. Um, uh, Robert, viruses are exosomes and other bits of dead genetic material. CDC pulled the same stunts with AIDS, Ebola, etc. I can't actually, again, the question sort of died. So uh, if you want, there's no question in there. If you could just send that again, uh, Shortened version, uh, viruses are exosomes um, and other bits of death. I'm not really sure. I, I, um, 
Yeah, I think I know what you're alluding to, uh, Robert. Is, is, is the, you mean an exosome as in they bits of genetic material that are not part of the main chromosome and that vaccines for them are developed in cell lines that um, might uh, contain other bits of genetic material. If that's the case, if that's what you're alluding to, uh, th that is true. That is what they are. Um, I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure what you unfortunately I, because I can't read the rest of it pull the same stunt with a I'm not sure what I'm not sure what you're referring to there, so if you can maybe just um, uh, say it shorter just because then it all appears in here, uh, that'd be great. But otherwise, um, I hope that was illuminating or at least um, in, interesting. Um, and uh, yes, uh, it it was good to chat. And let's let's I will try and appear again. If there's anything specific of interest from a virus point of view, let me know, and I I'll be very happy to chat about that uh, in a in a day or two or three at the same time. Right. All the best to you. Bye bye.